a long time ago in a country far, far away. We are in the middle of an epic serial adventure in which our hero continues to deal with setbacks as well as victories, and mostly dealing with his family. Welcome to the Bible Paladin, and thank you for joining me as we continue our journey through the book of Genesis. Today we will be following Jacob and his family as they finally decide to leave the house of Laban and return to Canaan, the land promised to his father and grandfather. But as we've seen before, this will not be an easy task, as struggle and strife tend to follow Jacob and his family. As we've seen before, this particular narrative seems to have been edited by the inspired author from two different stories, so it may be difficult to follow at times. But it also allows us to see how God works in partnership with Jacob's wit to allow him to formulate a plan to leave with at least some of his possessions that he had earned while working for Laban. And so let us dive right into the story and hear about Jacob's plan. We ask the Lord to inspire our reading of the sacred text. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Give me leave to go to my homeland. Let me have my wives, for whom I served you, and my children, too, that I may depart. You know very well the service that I have rendered you. Laban answered him, If you will, please. I have learned through divination that it is because of you that God has blessed me. So, he continued, state what wages you want from me, and I will pay them. Jacob replied, you know what work I did for you and how well your livestock fared under my care. The little you had before I came has grown into very much, since the Lord's blessings came upon you in my company. Therefore, I should now do something for my own household as well. What should I pay you? Laban asked. Jacob answered, You do not have to pay me anything outright. I will again pasture and tend your flock. If you do this one thing for me, go through your whole flock today and remove from it every dark animal among the sheep and every spotted or speckled one among the goats. Only such animals shall be my wages. In the future, whenever you check on these wages of mine, let my honesty testify against me. Any animal in my possession that is not a speckled or spotted goat or a dark sheep, got there by theft. Very well, agreed Laban. Let it be as you say. That same day, Laban removed the streaked and spotted he-goats and all the speckled and spotted she-goats, all those with some white on them, as well as the fully dark-colored sheep, those he left in charge of his sons. Then he put a three days journey between himself and Jacob, while Jacob continued to pasture the rest of Laban's flock. Jacob, however, got some fresh shoots of poplar, almond, and plane trees, and he made white stripes in them by peeling off the bark down to the white core of the shoots. The rods that he had thus peeled, he then set upright in the watering troughs, so that they would be in front of the animals that drank from the troughs. When the animals were in heat as they came to drink, the goats mated by the rods, and so they brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted kids. The sheep, on the other hand, Jacob kept apart, and he set these animals to face the streaked or fully dark-colored animals of Laban. Thus he produced special flocks of his own, which he did not put with Laban's flock. Moreover, whenever the hardier animals were in heat, Jacob would set the rods in the troughs in view of these animals, so that they mated by the rods. But with the weaker animals, he would not put the rods there, so the feeble animals would go to Laban, but the sturdy ones to Jacob. Thus the man grew increasingly prosperous, and he came to own not only large flocks, but also male and female servants, and camels and asses. Up until this time, Jacob has been working for Laban, his uncle and father-in-law, to pay off the debt for marrying his daughters, seven years for each. And as we will learn in the next chapter, he will work an additional six years tending Laban's flocks. Note the imperfect number six to refer to that which is Laban's. So now Jacob wants to make sure that he has something to take with him, other than just his family. Because according to some traditions, as we will see as we continue reading, even they were considered to be Laban's property. And so what Jacob proposes actually would only give him a small amount of livestock based on the typical colorings of sheep and goats in the Near East. For only a limited number of sheep would have the dark patches, and only a few goats would have the white streaks. And so, knowing of Laban's greed... I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Right? Even so... Laban proves his scheming and greediness by sending away all of the sheep and goats that he would have given to Jacob to his sons, who are far enough away that they will not interbreed with Jacob's flock. 
But Jacob also has a plan through some clever breeding based on some popular beliefs about what an animal sees while they are mating. But he also uses the strongest sheep and goats to make sure that he gets the best and most robust flocks that he can, showing that even these ancient people understood some concept of natural selection. And so Jacob goes ahead and does this, but we'll find out later that this also may have been inspired by a dream as we hear that it was God's plan all along. Theologically, this chapter continues to expand upon the promise that God has made to Jacob and his forefathers. The abundance of sons that will be the start of a great people has been established, as well as one from his beloved, Rachel. The next part of the promise necessitates that Jacob return to Canaan in order for his family to inherit the promised land. So let us read about his escape. Jacob learned that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything that belonged to our father, and he has accumulated all this wealth of his by using our father's property. Jacob perceived, too, that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had previously been. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers, where you were born, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent for Rachel and Leah to meet him where he was in the field with his flock. Then he said to them, I have noticed that your father's attitude toward me is not as it was in the past, but the God of my father has been with me. You well know what effort I put into serving your father. Yet your father cheated me and changed my wages time after time. God, however, did not let him do me any harm. Whenever your father said, the speckled animals shall be your wages, the entire flock would be speckled young. Whenever he said, the streaked animals shall be your wages, the entire flock would bear streaked young. Thus God reclaimed your father's livestock and gave it to me. Once in the breeding season, I had a dream in which I saw mating he-goats that were streaked, speckled, and mottled. In the dream, God's messenger called to me, Jacob, here, I replied. Then he said, note well, all the he-goats in the flock, as they mate, are streaked, speckled, and mottled, for I have seen all the things that Laban had been doing to you. I am the God who appeared to you in Bethel, where you anointed a memorial stone and made a vow to me. Up, then, leave this land and return to the land of your birth. Rachel and Leah answered him, Have we still an heir's portion in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as outsiders? He not only sold us, he has even used up the money that he got for us. All the wealth that God reclaimed from our father really belongs to us and our children. Therefore, do just as God has told you. Jacob proceeded to put his children and wives on camels, and he drove off with all his livestock and all the property he had acquired in Paran Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone away to shear his sheep, and Rachel had meanwhile appropriated her father's household idols. Jacob had hoodwinked Laban the Aramean by not telling him of his intended flight. Thus he made his escape with all that he had. Once he was across the Euphrates, he headed for the highlands of Gilead. On the third day, word came to Laban that Jacob had fled. Taking his kinsmen with him, He pursued him for seven days until he caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. But that night, God appeared to Laban the Aramean in a dream and warned him, take care not to threaten Jacob with any harm. As the story continues, we hear again that refrain of siblings complaining that someone else took what belonged to them. Let's just like in the story of Jacob and Esau. But here we see that his wives actually put aside their sibling rivalry and agreed to go with him because they've seen how that their father had treated them and Jacob and had spent all the money that really should have been the dowry um, for them. And so we have them preparing to leave. And then Rachel, because of this, goes and steals her father's household idols or the gods that he would keep in his house and pray to. We also hear in this version of the story that Jacob doesn't take credit for the plan of the breeding of the sheep and the goats, but rather it was all God's plan and that God allowed this to happen. It also shows how he continues to depend on the promise of God and that God continues to protect him while he is in this foreign land and that God will continue to be with him as he leaves and returns to the promised land. We also hear some familiar numbers as Laban discovers that they left on the third day and then pursues them for seven days. Seven here seems to be more symbolic for it would have taken much longer to get from Padamaran to Gilead than seven days but is used here simply to refer to a long period of time.
Let's pause for a moment and look at another Bible fun fact. This one about camels. You may have noticed if you're using Bible commentaries, or depending on your Bible, it may say in the footnotes that the use or the mention of camels is a bit anachronistic, meaning that they would not have been domesticated yet in this time period in the ancient Near East. So if that is true, why are they mentioned? The most common answer is that we are reading stories that were told and written down centuries after they occurred. The authors did not know the year in which camels were domesticated, but did know of the wealth of the patriarchs and that they had many beasts of burden. It was only natural to include camels in these stories, since that is what they and their audience were familiar with at the time of its writing. It's like painting a picture. Renaissance painters have never visited the Middle East and instead use their own experience of landscapes, buildings, and dress to inspire their artwork. Even today, many people have this idea that Jesus and his followers lived a very European lifestyle for this reason. Text and art allow people to enter into and relate to a story, and the sacred scripture is no exception. History and archaeology allow us to dig a bit deeper on how these things might have really been without changing the meaning of the stories. With that being said, not all historians agree on when camels were domesticated, and some hold that it would have not been a stretch to say that the patriarchs would have used them. I have linked an article on BibleArchaeology.org if you want to read more on the subject. So now back to our regularly scheduled program as we finish reading the chapter. When Laban overtook Jacob, Jacob's tents were pitched in the highlands. Laban also pitched his tents there on Mount Gilead. What do you mean, Laban demanded of Jacob, by hoodwinking me and carrying off my daughters like war captives? Why did you dupe me by stealing away secretly? You should have told me, and I would have sent you off with merry singing to the sound of tambourines and harps. You did not even allow me a parting kiss to my daughters and grandchildren. What you have done now is a senseless thing. I have it in my power to harm all of you. But last night, the God of your father said to me, Take care not to threaten Jacob with any harm. Granted that you had to leave because you were desperately homesick for your father's house. Why did you steal my gods? I was frightened, Jacob replied to Laban, at the thought that you might take your daughters away from me by force. But as for your gods, the one you find them with shall not remain alive. If, with my kinsmen looking on, you identify anything here as belonging to you, take it. Jacob, of course, had no idea that Rachel had stolen the idols. Laban then went in and searched Jacob's tent and Leah's tent, as well as the tents of the two maidservants, but he did not find the idols. Leaving Leah's tent, he went into Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the idols, put them inside a camel cushion, and seated herself upon them. When Laban had rummaged through the rest of her tent without finding them, Rachel said to her father, Let not my lord feel offended that I cannot rise in your presence. A woman's period is upon me. So, despite his search, he did not find his idols. Jacob, now enraged, upbraided Laban. What crime or offense have I committed, he demanded, that you should hound me so fiercely? Now that you have ransacked all my things, have you found a single object taken from your belongings? If so, produce it here before your kinsmen and mine, and let them decide between us two. In the twenty years that I was under you, no you or she-goat of yours ever miscarried, and I have never feasted on a ram of your flock. I never brought you an animal torn by wild beasts, I made good the loss myself. You held me responsible for anything stolen by day or night. How often the scorching heat ravaged me by day and the frost by night, while sleep fled from my eyes. Of the twenty years that I have now spent in your household, I slaved fourteen years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, while you changed my wages time after time. If my ancestral God, the God of Abraham and the awesome one of Isaac, had not been on my side, you would now have sent me away empty-handed. But God saw my plight and the fruits of my toil, and last night he gave judgment. Laban replied to Jacob, The women are mine, the children are mine, and the flocks are mine. Everything you see belongs to me. But since these women are my daughters, I will now do something for them and for the children they have born. Come then, we will make a pact. You and I, the Lord shall be a witness between us. Then Jacob took a stone and set it up as a memorial stone. Jacob said to his kinsmen, Gather some stones. So they got some stones and made a mound, and they had a meal there at the mound. Laban called it 
Yegar Sahadahutha, but Jacob named it Galiad. This mound, said Laban, shall be a witness from now on between you and me. That is why it was named Galiad, and also Mizpah, for he said, May the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight. If you mistreat my daughters or take other wives besides my daughters, remember that even though no one else is about, God will be the witness between you and me. Laban said further to Jacob, Here is this mound, and here is the memorial stone that I have set up between you and me. This mound shall be witness, and this memorial stone shall be witness, that with hostile intent neither may I pass beyond this mound into your territory, nor may you pass beyond it into mine. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, their ancestral deities, maintain justice between us. Jacob took the oath by the awesome one of Isaac. He then offered a sacrifice on the mountain and invited his kinsmen to share in the meal. When they had eaten, they passed the night on the mountain. Laban is obviously very upset when he finally catches up with Jacob and his family. But God warned him in a dream not to harm Jacob, and so he really can't do anything to him other than give him a stern reproach. Although he does accuse them of stealing one of his household idols. And Jacob, not knowing that anyone took anything, gives him a bold statement that if anyone is caught with one of the idols, they will be executed on the spot. Now, Rachel takes a page out of Jacob's playbook and fools her father by sitting on the idols and claiming that she cannot get up because it is her time of the month. This, of course, gives Jacob the opportunity to let Laban have it. And he explains to him and to us how good of a worker that he was, how honest of a laborer he was in spite of Laban's treatment of him. But Jacob goes above and beyond what was required of him. Also, Laban then is not to be outdone, and he insists that all Jacob has are legally his, but he will be gracious enough to make a treaty with him, and that they shall part ways and will not cross each other's boundaries in hostility, and that also Jacob will never let any harm come to his daughters, nor be unfaithful to them. Such a covenant is made with God as their witness. And this also notes another difference that is pointed out between Laban and Jacob, as Laban is referred to as an Aramean and uses Aramaic words. Also, his God is referred to, the God of Laban's ancestors, in opposition to the God of Jacob and his ancestors, showing that these two families will become further estranged and develop into different nations. This covenant, as usual, is celebrated and ratified with a sacrifice and a meal. And this part of the narrative ends in the next few verses of chapter 32. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters goodbye. Then he set out on his journey back home, while Jacob continued on his own way. Then God's messengers encountered Jacob. When he saw them, he said, This is God's encampment. So he named that place Mahanaim. You may have noticed that Laban kisses and blesses his daughters and grandchildren, but not Jacob. Even though he had entered into a pact with them, he still does not see him as a son. Of course, Jacob still has the blessing of his own father, and that is the one that will remain with him throughout his life. And then, of course, as they re-enter into Canaan, the promised land, once again, Jacob encounters the angels of God, which shows that this is a truly the place of God, the holy land, so to speak. And also, this foreshadows Jacob's later encounter with an angel, which many of us are familiar with when he wrestles with God. But this also shows really the continuous struggle that Jacob has both with God and man. Theologically, these stories of Jacob's escape continue to show us the cooperation between human activity and God's plan. Here we see God acting in the background as Jacob uses his own gifts and cunning to care for his own family, despite the plotting of his father-in-law. He finds ways to provide for them and make his way back to the promised land. And as he does so, his own faith in the divine continues to grow. It also brings up some ethical questions about some of the dishonest or at least misleading behavior of Jacob and Rachel. It reminds me of that scene in The Sound of Music when the sisters thwart the Nazi pursuit of the Von Trapp family. Reverend Mother, what's this sin, my children? And while this will be part of a much larger conversation about morality, the idea of motive and the why we do what we do should always be part of the thought process about right and wrong. Even when we get to the book of Genesis and we start looking at the law itself, it is important to distinguish between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And this is something that is a big part of the ministry of Jesus, as he condemns the Pharisees and the scribes 
for adhering too strictly to the law and especially using it to harm those for whom it was supposed to protect. So Jacob and Rachel, when they deceive Laban, it is really done for the sake of their own family. With that being said, how can we take these stories to heart today? For one, simply being tricked or mistreated should not be seen as a reason to mistreat another. I often think about it this way. One should not let someone's lack of values define their own values. What I mean by this is that if someone does harm to you in some way or behaves in a particular way that you would typically not, why change your behavior in response? Doing so does a couple of things. One, it allows the other person a certain degree of control over you and your actions. Secondly, it often compromises your own virtue and leads you down a path that causes more harm than good. This also speaks to the difference between justice and vengeance. Jacob ends up taking what he was owed, despite Laban's unjust treatment of him. That was justice. Were Jacob to have killed Laban's flocks of animals or burned down his house, that would have been vengeance. Also, Jacob didn't change his behavior in order to outwit Laban. He was always a cunning trickster and used the gifts that God had given him in order to best serve his family. Another lesson in this narrative is that God works with us and often uses us to accomplish the divine plan. We can't expect to simply pray and have God do all the heavy lifting. As we continue through the Old Testament, we will see more and more examples of God allowing his people to figure things out themselves and execute their plans as they see fit. Sometimes they will get it right, but often we'll get it wrong as well. When needed, God will give a nudge and point them in the right direction. I believe that this pattern still exists in our lives today. The more we turn to God for guidance and trust in him, the more often we'll get it right. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope that you found our reading of the Bible to be inspiring. And please join me next time when we see what happens when Jacob finally meets up with his brother Esau after all of these years. We'll also hear about the struggle that he has with the Lord and the origin of his name, Israel. Until then, may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob be with you, and do good.